right, so moving on then <clears throat> to the spread of industrialization. I'm not going to talk, talk much about some of these things. We've already kind of covered them, and the textbook does a nice job. Um, just the ways in which things like clocks, textiles, and guns, sewing machines, things like this, introduction of the assembly line, um, extraction of natural resources, these are all things that are um, on a mass scale going to be new for the world and significant. And um, same things with the railroads and so on. Okay, so um, moving on to that, to talk about the effects of industrialization. I feel like I've also been talking a lot about that as well. Um, um, just to say, talking about larger number of workers, um, it's interesting. I read a, a theorist, I'm going to say theorist, right? Say that um, the reason why you will never see a, a, a capitalist country have full employment, in other words, Unemployment is a requirement almost for capitalism to thrive because if everybody's employed and no one likes their working conditions and they go on strike, then it shuts down the business completely. While if there's a large pool of desperate workers, then you can always keep wages low because if someone says, well, I'm going to quit, then the boss just says, well, that's fine. There's five other guys or girls waiting for this job. And so that for, for capitalism to thrive and for businesses to be able to thrive, you have to have a pool of labor. Um, that's a theory. I think it makes sense. The implication is that poverty then, to a certain extent, is a requirement for capitalism to thrive, if that is a correct theory. Um, so that would be like more on the critical side uh, um, of it. On the other side, then, you know, people are always going to keep pointing out that um, if you don't have the industrialist, if you don't have the capitalist, then you're not going to have a job provided for somebody unless you have a communist state that's going to provide the, the job through the, com through the government in which it's not going to run well and necessarily create a profit. So it's like, I don't know if you're following this, you, you know, each side can make a strong case. And that's kind of what I want to point out um, without trying to advocate or push a particular view. Um, but th these are the kind of debates that you're actually seeing on Fox News compared to CNN and between Democrats and Republicans, although they tend to not be as explicit. And in American politics, it's very darbled. But, you know, as you study this and we go into the next chapter, um, as I was mentioning in your syllabus, you should be able to start fought, like really getting a grasp of what's at stake in, in, in the debates um, that are going on over these things. Standards of living, uh, st stagnant wages. Um, we know at the time, you know, the issue of people having healthier diets. You, you know, you obviously saw that capitalism was was doing um, things better on one hand, and on the other, I mean. You saw there people working 14 hours a day, sometimes not even being able to stop to eat, like eating while they're working. Um, and excessive pollution. That's what's going on in the rest of the world under American companies, under European companies, where the labor laws don't protect uh, workers. That's still going on. It's normal, actually. And, um, and unfortunate. And the same arguments that were made to justify it then are taking place now. And the same criticisms of, of it back then are still taking place now. It's just, that's that's where we're at. In a strange sense, it's almost like you're, you can read this chapter and almost nothing has changed except locations. And um, now there's less and less unions here. The unions have a different reputation. Did, did, did unions do things wrong? Or did unions and workers' rights in America um, overreach? But there is now kind of this idea. I mean, you know, uh, uh, I mean, you'll see in the next, next chapters, and we'll, we'll, we'll be going down the line, that many freedoms you take for granted when you come to work to be able to take a, a, a bathroom break, that, that uh, if you get sick and have to go home, that you don't just get fired. That the, uh, a boss can't lock you into a room with no windows for, for 14 hours without breathing or, or sunlight. And uh, uh, that your kids don't have to go to work and get beat by a boss. 
Um, how did these things change? The one thing this text doesn't really emphasize is that there was a labor movement, and we're going to learn more about that. But um, the many freedoms that we take for granted that we think are that we're so proud to be an American for are things that actually a labor movement uh, ends up sometimes getting beat up by uh, police and the state and private uh, um, uh, guards of industry until political legislators decide to change things. And yes, we did see, even in this text here, um, that certain politicians recognized that this was bad. And not all business owners thought it was good, but, but this was a general practice until there was a struggle. And that's just something I want you to think about. And I want you to think about it also in the context of nowadays, okay? And at the same time, you know, people do want businesses. They do want uh, entrepreneurs to bring over uh, and, and, and make, make room for jobs, right? So this is, this is the contradiction of capitalism. It's a contradiction is the word that we'll again talk a lot about. Let me get to Karl Marx and his thoughts on capitalism and its pluses and its minuses, okay? Um, and if you noticed on 671, uh, I hope you read two different ideas about whether or not industrialization was creating an, uh, uh, good things for people. One writer is making a, a, a positive statement about the conditions for the average workers. And then Frederick Engels is saying another thing. He was a contemporary with Karl Marx. He also wrote with him the Communist Manifesto. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, you should take a look at those two. Okay, um, and again, so this was all about what we're talking about. Um, and the idea of child labor, again, was um, considered a big deal. There was a lot of child labor here in the United States. Um, later on, we may talk about Mother Jones. There's a, a you know, a media uh, a journal called Mother Jones Now. Um, you should look her up if you're interested in the topic of, of people fighting for rights of children, for example, even in the United States. Um, but uh, my understanding was a while back that, that, that there were really, really narrow uh, spots for um, fireplaces in certain rich manors where there were sometimes boys in rich uh, aristocratic homes that were only given a meal a day so they were skinny enough to like get into the pipes and clean them. Uh, in a sense, uh, a type of slavery, an unofficial type of slavery that was uh, an entitlement expected by some elites. Okay, and uh, here are the theme uh, and pictures, you know, of of kids going off to to work, um, and critics of some of these conditions. This is a cartoon, Capital and Labor, where. Um, Basically, workers are used as like poker chips, right, in games by big, uh, fat, wealthy, well-off uh, industrialists. And, you know, as you're seeing all this, this is going to explain to you why. Whether you think this is positive or negative. Um, and in America, socialism is generally seen as negative. The idea of a nanny state, of welfare, um who had this idea, you know, of government spending all this money on people who aren't working, you know, all this kind of stuff. The issues that the Democrats and Republicans fight about. But um, socialism and communism and, and, and all these ideas that seem so uh, foreign to us really were a, a, a response to a feeling that they did see more inequality than not. And later on, there's going to be the growth of a large middle class, which is going to tamper the popularity of some of those what we'd call leftist political ideologies. But ultimately, um, you know, Europe was much more on a broader level acceptable uh, uh, to some of these kind of pro-labor socialist parties than are going to be in the United States, which is not... For here, if you want, if you want to have a discussion with me about why I I think that might be, uh, we can do that at another time. But um, in any case, that's totally true. Um, saying that you're a socialist in Britain is not the same as saying you're a socialist in the United States. Um, in fact, Tony Blair, um, the ally of George Bush, one of the few, called himself a socialist. Now, what is that? We'll talk about that again in the next chapter. Okay. 
So um, the idea of class and class consciousness. Again, this is something that is addressed by Karl Marx. I'm going to talk a lot about him next um, in the next chapter. But there's a debate with historians about whether or not how much people saw actually that uh, were conscious that they were becoming a part of a class, meaning workers, right? The aristocracy always knew they were a part of a class. They were, you know, you might be um, an ugly man and an attractive non-aristocratic woman wants to marry you. Well, you might want to you know, hook up with her, uh, maybe, but uh, you don't want to marry her because she's not of your class. And you know that it's impossible. You can't do it. You would forfeit yourself. So they were very conscious of their class. Um, you start having um, you know, people who own land. Um, and then you have people who collect money uh, from other people. But what are, you know, where were workers re really conscious of themselves as, like saying, we are the workers? Um, historians debate about how conscious they were of that. Um, but where the importance of that would be is then if you're a worker and you're, you have a class consciousness, the aristocracy and the business owners or the bourgeoisie, they know what's in their interests due to the status of their class. The question is, do workers always know what's in their interests? Are they going to vote for, are they, if they can vote, are they going to do things? Are they going to have a mindset where they see their own interests at stake and that they're going to make political decisions rather on the streets or in the ballots where it's available to get what they need? Right. OK, so that's kind of part of that that debate. And that, again, will get talked about heavily. Uh, Karl Marx will uh, be addressing that quite a bit. Um, and so, uh, again, uh, um, OK, you know, trade unions are a part of that class consciousness where you realize, hey, we as workers have a right to get together. And, um, you know, what about the right to vote? So so some of those things are seen as clear proof. Um, and. At the times they were in direct opposition to so again many things even now that are considered normal workers rights were seen as an opposition to your boss uh, uh, and to much of the bourgeoisie and some of the aristocratic class and now um, are seen more as something that you just take for granted um, I feel like I'm going to talk about this stuff more in the next chapter um, we do know that there were revolts right and so you had an example of that here um, where, you know, uh, you had a, a uh, um, in 18, 19, the Peterloo Massacre um, shows where people uh, were upset about things. So, so people were rebelling and it's not like people just can take living in bad conditions and say, oh, this is fine. No big deal. There's been slave revolts throughout history. They don't always get talked about and they don't uh, they didn't always find themselves being successful but you're going to see that workers that idea of class consciousness i think you are going to see in history many revolting and elites industrialists and politicians having to make needing to make a decision if they're going to compromise to calm the workers down and create stability because business Yes, some of these business guys didn't care about children and how it exploited their workers, but they need to have consumers. Then somebody's got to uh, be able to buy goods. They want a, so a society to be stable. If people are doing vandalism and breaking your stuff and being angry, um, that's not going to necessarily be to the advantage of your business. Okay, and so um, that's just something to talk about. So. Um, I'll go into a little bit more details here, and um, and then the next lecture I will kind of just go into um, how this affects um, other countries. Okay, I accidentally hit pause for a second. I don't know where I left off, but just to say um, I'm going to cover a little bit more, go into how it affects uh, industrialization in other countries in the empire, and then to the next chapter.